Recall that the operator known as DEL or NABLA is a differential operator that also has the structure of a vector. Here I've shown the representation of DEL in three-dimensional Cartesian coordinates. Because DEL is a vector, we can use it to perform operations quite normally undertaken by vectors, operations such as the dot product or the cross product, or simply scalar multiplication. So for example, if phi is a scalar field, depending on space position x, y and z, we can write down the grad of phi. Grad is short for gradient, so as the name suggests, the grad of phi tells us how fast phi is changing in various directions. If instead we introduce a vector field, f, depending on x, y and z, then we can take the dot product of del with f. That gives us something known as the divergence of f. It's a scalar, often abbreviated as div, and, as the name divergence suggests, it gives us an idea of how much the vector field diverges or spreads away from a given point. Finally, we could make the curl of f. It's just the cross product, which I've shown here using the normal determinant definition. Then I've expanded out the determinant to get the components of the curl. Don't be distressed by the lack of a minus sign on the J component. I've put a plus there, but I've reversed the order of the df1 dz and df3 by dx from the usual order in a determinant. That's compensated for the missing minus sign that's normally in the definition. Again, as its name suggests, the curl tells us something about the amount of rotational effect of f about a point. I found a nice little discussion of the curl in the Wikipedia website. I've cut and pasted it here. It's rather small, so I'll read it out. And although there are some highlighted words, you won't be able to click on them within the video. The address of the website is at the bottom, though. Here's what it says. Suppose the vector field in question describes the velocity field of a fluid flow, for example in a large tank of liquid or gas. Then imagine that we locate a small ball or bead somewhere within the gas at a fixed point. If that ball has a rough surface, we'd expect the fluid flowing past it will tend to make it rotate. The rotation axis then, oriented according to the right hand rule, points in the direction of the curl of the velocity vector field at the center of the ball. And as it happens, the angular speed of the rotation turns out to be half the magnitude of the curl at that point. For the rest of this recording, I'm going to focus on vector fields whose curl is zero. Since we've now understood that curl has to do with rotational effects, you can therefore see it's quite logical that such vector fields are called irrotational. So, for an irrotational vector field, the curl of f is the zero vector. To start off with, I want to show you a particular kind of vector field that is almost always rota irrotational. I'll explain that word almost at the end. So in fact, here, I'm starting with a scalar field, phi. I've then taken its gradient and then applied the curl operator to the gradient of phi. Let's see what that does. I'll start by writing out the gradient of the phi. So we've got the curl of the vector d phi dx, d phi dy, d phi dz. We could now put all that into the determinant structure. Here, I've used suffices for the differentiations to avoid the determinant getting too physically big. So phi x, for example, means d phi by dx, and curly dy means d by dy. Let's see what we get when we expand the determinant. You might want to pause the video for a moment and check what I've done here. It's the usual method for expanding a determinant, and we end up with these second derivatives. But now look at each individual component. The first one, d2 phi by dy dz minus d2 phi by dz dy. 
That's the same differentiations, just in the opposite order each time. It's the same in the second and third component. And now we can use the result that it is almost always the case that the order of differentiation is immaterial. That means that all of these terms cancel themselves. We end up with the zero vector. This is a very important result. The curl of a gradient is almost always zero. Perhaps I should explain that word almost now, and then I won't have to refer to it again. Mathematicians will tell you that these results hold true in a region of space which is known, which is called simply connected. I can't go into the details of what that means here, but basically simply connected means there are no holes in the space. If there are holes, then some of the results I've been telling you fail. Generally speaking, engineers don't meet spaces with holes in, and so it need be of no concern to you. So, here in the blue box, I've written down what we've discovered. The gradient of a scalar field has its curl equal to zero. That means that the gradient of such a scalar field is irrotational. It's completely independent of the specific structure of the scalar field. It works for any phi. But now I'm going to tell you another result. I won't prove this one. It's not particularly hard to prove, but it would take up quite a lot of time in the video. It turns out that if f is an irrotational vector field, so its curl is zero, then f can always be expressed as the gradient of a scalar field. OK, so if curl of f is zero, then there is a phi such that f equals grad of phi. In part two of this recording, we'll introduce an actual f and show how to calculate the phi. The scalar field phi is called the potential for f. For the remainder of this recording, I want to explore some of the consequences, or in fact one important consequence, of f having a potential. So, let's start with a field f, which is irrotational, and suppose that it has a potential phi. That gives us the equations curl f equals zero and f equals grad phi. I'm going to prove a very important result concerning the path integral of f along any path in space. So, let's draw ourselves a path. A path connecting two points, p1 and p2, in three dimensions. I've called the path c. I'm going to look at the path integral of f dot dr along c. Remember, we can write it this way. Let's substitute for f in terms of the gradient of the potential. Next, let's write out the components of the two vectors involved, with the dot product shown between the two of them. Like this. And then, of course, we should expand the dot product. Here's what we get. Look at that integrand. If you've learned about the chain rule for multivariable functions, you'll understand that that integrand is simply d phi. That's very simple, isn't it? But now we have the integral of d phi. Since integration and differentiation are inverse procedures for each other, that means we can do the integration and just get the function phi. The path c tells us that we should put the points p2 and p1 on and evaluate them as endpoints for the integral. The substitution just amounts to putting in the coordinates x1, y1, z1 and x2, y2, z2 and taking the difference in the usual way that we do for integration limits. So we end up with the following. And that's the result I wanted to get to. So what, I hear you say? What's so special about this? Well, what's special about it is that we never actually said what the path was. I drew just some general squiggle from P1 to P2, but I could just as easily have chosen a different path. We could call the first one C1 and the second one C2. Or 
I could just as easily have chosen a C3 that goes miles away. Can go off around the world if you like, and come back. Whoops. And come back to P2. And yet, the value of the integral is still the same. Even though the coordinates may change wildly, and the values of phi, as we change along the path, as we move along the path, will vary quite dramatically, possibly, in the end, the value of the integral is just phi evaluated at the endpoints and with the difference taken. That really is a very powerful result, and it's very important in physics and engineering. In part two, we'll introduce an actual vector field, show how to calculate its potential, and then perform a path integral of the vector field along a path.